let's start. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope uh, you are doing uh, well today. Uh, I'm really glad to see uh, a lot of people here. And uh, I believe that this information will be useful for you. Uh, I'm going to share it today. Thank you for joining the meeting and thank you for being interested in, the, in this topic. Um, this is my debut in the community. So just to get to know each other uh, a bit better, uh, especially at these hard times uh, when we don't have a chance to uh, bump into each other at the office, uh, I'd like to say a couple of words about myself. Um, I've been work working for SoftServ for nine plus years. My current official position is a senior software engineer, uh, but uh, I, I've been leading small teams of Java backend developers for over three years. Uh, I had a chance to work uh, on quite different projects uh, that uh, are wearing in technological stack, business domains, and team sizes. Uh, the rest information you can find on LinkedIn if you are interested in. in. Uh, so we are quite limited in time, but I'll try to briefly walk through the theoretical stuff. Uh, if we have additional time, we will switch to a live coding session in order to test the theory in practice. Uh, for somebody, I may, may not say something new or unique, uh, but I hope um, this is not our first and the last session. Uh, depending on the feedback and in case you feel it is needed for you, uh, this might become a series of speeches um, that will allow us to touch Java concurrency from a more practical uh, standpoint and uh, extend our knowledge deeper and wider. So this speech intended to cover basic concurrency theory. Uh, during the meeting, we will touch the Java concurrency concepts. Uh, we will classify them in order to be able to create low-level multi-threaded and concurrent programs and move further in using concurrency while designing and uh, implementing uh, the real application. Let's start with uh, the basic terms that define multi-threading and the concurrency in the modern computing world. So multi-threading, uh, this is special technique that allows simultaneous execution of two or more parts of the program. It is intended to maximize the utilization of a CPU. Concurrency, uh, this is special state uh, when the application runs multiple tasks that are competing for CPU resources. Uh, parallel execution means when a computer has more than one CPU or a CPU with multiple cores, so it can run tasks uh, simultaneously. When we talk about uh, parallelism, uh, this means that um, like this is the special way of splitting piece of work to smaller uh, independent slices uh, to process them in parallel. And the last uh, important term in concurrency theory is context switching. So uh, this is the technique uh, where CPU time is shared across uh, running uh, process. Um, and let's talk about process and uh, thread. So when we are talking about multitasking in the computing world, we can imagine um, a set of programs that are running in parallel and doing uh, multiple jobs at the same time. But actually, um, they are running more concurrently uh, than in parallel. Uh, even if you have multiple CPU cores, operating system can run thousands of activities uh, in a way we can't even notice they are not running in parallel. Uh, Operating system can assign slice of CPU resources to the process with so fast contact switching between uh, the processes that uh, it brought concurrent multi-threaded environments so useful uh, in practice. Uh, so what is the process? Uh, 
this is uh, an instance of running program is called actually process. So on the slide, we can see uh, our program that in general consists of uh, the specific instructions and the data that these instructions must be executed on. Uh, when we start our program, uh, the operating system makes an instance of the program. And uh, this is actually a process. Uh, the process has its own uh, isolated address space in memory and it can communicate with each other. Um, in, in Linux like operating systems, um, processes are organized in a tree and the root of that tree is systemd process. Um, that is started by, by, by the Linux core uh, during booting uh, the op operating system. Each of those processes um, can uh, like ha have its own ID uh, and uh, it can be controlled from the outside with specific signals. So let me briefly um, switch to my terminal and show you how it looks. So let's use um, such an utility like uh, PS3. So as you can see, um, processes are organized in a tree and in the root of this tree is systemd process. Um, let's use another tool. Um, this is yes, um, let me see. So here you can see that each process has assigned a specific a unique process ID with which we can uh, identify the specific process. Um, to manage these processes from the outside, we can use um, we can use uh, specific signals that we can send uh, to the process. And uh, the responsibility of the process is to uh, identify this signal and um, and do appropriate actions to uh, handle its. Uh, Termination. So, who who uses uh, Linux uh, might already know about uh, something about this command. Uh, it allows us to uh, kill the process. Uh, we won't kill anything right now, but I just want you to show the list of signals that we can send to the process in order to um, to do specific actions. Uh, related to these signals. We won't stop uh, on the specific signal or the list of signals, but uh, if you have time later, you can review it and use uh, these uh, signals when you design your uh, application. One more item I want you to show about the processes is uh, the way how they uh, are organized and um, like we have two kind of uh, design that uh, is used to create our program. So we have a single process application and multi-process application. And the best example of multi-process application is uh, Google Chrome. Uh, and in general, um, we have uh, like the process uh, which is asso associated with the specific tab in browser. Uh, and um, the, I believe that uh, Google uh, developers decided to choose this approach um, with multi-processes because um, it protects overall application uh, from bugs when uh, rendering the pages by its engine. And uh, it prevents from running a weight of too much memory and CPU uh, memory, uh, like in case some uh, websites or some uh, browser applications hang and become unresponsive. Uh, additional benefit is um, if we have, uh, for example, uh, a lot of idle tabs in browser, uh, uh, operating system can manage them uh, by reducing the priority of this process and um, the, re reduce the resources that uh, is needed to uh, run this process. Uh, because uh, it may think that uh, idle tabs uh, is not so important. Uh, 
uh, comparing with the active ones. So um, this is uh, such an advantage of uh, multi-process approach. That's it about processes. Uh, let's continue with the presentation. And let's talk about thread. Uh, thread is an independent path of execution uh, through programs code. Threads are created within the process, so um, each process has at least one thread. Um, thread shares the process resources. And uh, I, when I talk about resources, I mean uh, a memory or some other resources like um, files, uh, etc. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, here I put a uh, basic comparison uh, of the process and the thread. I don't want to spend uh, a lot of time on this slide, but um, the communication uh, between processes uh, worth mentioning. Uh, so it's uh, actually this is kind, this is like very interesting interesting topic uh, and I had to stop a bit on it, uh, on this. Um, like, and this is essential to be at least aware of such an ability and uh, you may need it sometime uh, and you will know what to Google if you need it. Uh, and uh, the first way of communication between processes is a memory mapped file. Actually, this is a virtual file that can be uh, loaded into memory with a Java Neo uh, library and uh, accessed by different processes. Internally, um, Java creates a memory buffer to represent a portion of a file um, the data in, uh, in this buffer managed by uh, the operating system. This way uh, is much faster than using uh, simple files on disk. So, um, and uh, this buffer uh, is placed outside of the Java heap and uh, this buffer is not managed by a uh, garbage collector. Uh, the next uh, item uh, is very popular and you uh, you probably already used it for debugging the applications. And this is uh, GMX. And uh, GMX, uh, this is a technology um, created to monitor and manage Java applications uh, via network. Um, So the most popular tool that uses JMX is Java console. This is a very good example of utilization of this technology uh, through which we can uh, connect to the application, manage its state, uh, see some uh, memory usage, uh, objects created, etc. So let's uh, move to the next slide. Um, and talk about race condition and critical section. Uh, race condition uh, occurs when two or more threads can access shared data and they try to change it at the same time. Because the thread scheduling algorithm can swap between threads at any time, um, we don't know the order in which the threads will attempt to access the shared data. And on the screen, we can see uh, the race condition between two threads, threads uh, thread A and thread B. So each thread tries to take some uh, value from the memory and add uh, another value to get the result and put back it to memory. Uh, so when uh, the thread do it, um, at the same time, uh, the result uh, won't be uh, as expected. Yeah. So in other words, uh, to like race condition, it's a piece of 
of code that is uh, executed by uh, multiple threads at the same time. Critical section um, is a block of code that accesses uh, shared resources and it can be executed by more than one thread at the same time. On the second uh, part of this uh, image, you can see that uh, we, are, we prevented race condition by synchronizing these operations and um, it is executed one by one uh, and we get the correct result in, in the memory. Finally, we, we move to runnable, callable, and thread. So uh, runnable, callable, this is interfaces in Java thread is uh, class. So uh, the difference between uh, these items is a very common Java multi-thread and interview question, but um, unfortunately not everyone can explain the correct usage of each one. Uh, so probably all of you uh, know that Java has uh, limitation in multiple inheritance. So if we need to um, create some code, uh, to be executed in parallel uh, on multiple threads. And at the same time, you want to extend some existing code. Uh, so uh, we won't be able to extend uh, thread anymore. Uh, the second uh, reason is uh, better encapsulation. Um, uh, when we use runnable instance, uh, it allows us to better encapsulate the code which should be run in parallel. From the OOP perspective, um, like if we need to enhance, enhance something, we use uh, Java inheritance. But when we need um, to create some piece of code uh, to be executed in parallel, we don't need to enhance anything. Like when we extend thread, we are not going to uh, enhance the thread itself. We just need a, a run method and put some code into run method to be executed in, in parallel. So remember it. Um, uh, another difference between thread and runnable comes from the fact that we are extending thread class just for the run method as I told but we will get overhead of all other methods uh, which come uh, from thread class. So if our goal is just to write some code in the run method uh, for parallel execution, then we have to use runnable interface instead of extending uh, thread. Let's talk uh, briefly about the thread lifecycle. Uh, so as soon as we create a, a thread, it will be in a new state. Uh, when we start a thread, uh, it will change its uh, status for runnable. Uh, thread can be blocked uh, when we uh, use a Java synchronization mechanism. Uh, for example, if we use uh, logs uh, and uh, a thread wait for the lock, so it will be in block state. Uh, the waiting state means uh, when we are waiting for a specific condition. For example, um, we may call a uh, thread join to wait uh, when uh, another thread uh, completes its execution. So uh, during that time, the thread will be waiting or just call uh, object uh, dot wait method uh, to wait for some specific condition. This is also a uh, means that thread will be in waiting state. Time and waiting, uh, it's a very similar state to the previous one, but uh, this means that we won't wait forever. Uh, we just specify some specific timeout uh, and when this timeout uh, pass, 
uh, threat will uh, wake up. And uh, the last state is terminated. This means that um, threat has completed its execution. Next slide, uh, tell us uh, a bit about the priority of the threat. Uh, so uh, in Java, we have um, 10 level of priorities and uh, few of them are put into a constant. Um, so I recommend not to use these uh, priorities when you design a specific algorithm and uh, this algorithm is tightly depend on the priorities because uh, these priorities are highly uh, operating system dependent. And uh, for example, in Windows, um, if I'm not mistaken, it has seven priorities and uh, Java maps its 10 priorities to th that seven priorities. In Linux-like operating system, mm, I believe that it ignores all the priorities altogether. So don't use this, ju ju you, you can treat at uh, you can treat these priorities as uh, just recommendation to Java to organize um, the uh, the threads, but don't rely on it. So let's move further uh, and let's review the concepts of synchronization in multi-threaded program. So the monitor uh, is a synchronization construction that allows exclusive access to the shared resources. Mm, this concept was defined uh, in late 70s, I believe. So if you need uh, to get more information about it, you can find some papers uh, on Wikipedia um, to just, just to be aware of the um, true definition of the monitor. In Java, uh, it is a bit modified, but in general, the concepts uh, are met. So, um, so the monitor allows thread to have a mutual exclusion. Uh, it is called mutex. Uh, this the situation when only one thread can execute the piece of code at a certain point of time. It, um, in Java, we can uh, achieve this with logs or intrinsic log. The, uh, and the second item uh, that describes the monitor is a condition. Um, this is uh, the ability to make threads wait for a certain condition to be met. Um, essentially, uh, it it is a container of threads that are waiting for a certain condition. So um, does anybody know uh, from the audience, audience why this concept is called monitor? Okay, nobody wants looks to like not. <laughs> yeah. I, like I can only guess. So what <laughs> like is it? Guess? Like it. Uh, like I think that this is used uh, for monitoring the thread state. Like probably when we have uh, uh, monitor lock lock some object by monitor. So uh, like the process may manipulate with states probably, but I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, you are very close. So mm, it, it was called monitor uh, because it monitors how uh, threads access uh, some resources. That's it, quite, quite uh, simple explanation. Uh, okay. 
let's move further. So let's talk a bit about synchronized. Uh, synchronized is a reserved keyword in Java and um, Probably everybody knows uh, that each object in Java uh, has intrinsic log. This is uh, like built-in mechanism uh, that allows us to synchronize the critical sections. And uh, this uh, intrinsic log uh, can be used by the, uh, putting synchronized keyword in, in your code uh, on method level or some code block level. We will uh, review this in more details when we switch to the real code examples. Um, the intrinsic uh, log has also built in a condition mechanism. So, um, this, uh, this condition can be uh, manipulated by calling wait notify notify all method. We, also, we will also review uh, how the method work uh, in a while. So this mechanism of intrinsic logs uh, and condition have some limitations. Um, so the first is uh, we are not able to interrupt a thread that is trying to acquire a log. Uh, the second is uh, we cannot specify a timeout when trying to acquire a log. And uh, probably the most important is um, intrinsic log has, can have only one uh, so associated condition. And uh, this is not efficient for some algorithm because uh, sometimes we may need to uh, have few conditions to implement some algorithms. Uh, just because of this limitation uh, in Java, we have additional mechanism to uh, synchronize critical section. It's a uh, lock and condition. So, we will review them a bit later, how, how it works. Okay, let's move to the next slide. So let's talk about a few more concepts uh, in Java related to concurrency. And the first is volatile. This is also um, a reserved keyword uh, and uh, let me explain how it works. So computers with multiple processors can temporarily hold memory values in uh, registers uh, or local memory caches. Uh, as a consequence, threads running in different processors may see different values from the same uh, memory location. Uh, so volatile ensures that uh, value will be read from memory instead of CPU cache each time uh, when it is accessed. Thread local, uh, this is a specific class. Uh, by the way, it is uh, generalized and it enables us to create variables that can only be uh, read, and, uh, read and written by the same thread even uh, in case two threads are executing at the same, uh, this, uh, like threads uh, uh, executing the same, the same code. And uh, this code uh, has a reference to the same thread local variable. Next item is atomics. Um, so, you might think, uh, why do we need atomics? Uh, we have such flexible mechanisms with, with logs and conditions, um, but the issue is in performance. Uh, when multiple threads attempt to acquire a log 
only one them wins, uh, while the rest of the threads are um, either blocked or suspended. So the process of suspending and then resuming a thread is very expensive uh, and um, affects the overall efficiency of the system. In a small program when we need, for instance, some counter which is synchronized and can be called by multiple threads, um, the time spent for context switching may become more, uh, the, uh, much more than actual code execution. So let me switch to uh, editor to explain what is uh, atomic and what is atomic operation. So in Java, uh, when we define some variable and assign specific value to it. So this operation is atomic because it is done uh, in scope of uh, single CPU instruction. Uh, when you write uh, this operation, this operation uh, is not atomic because uh, to uh, evaluate this, uh, Java has to take the, the, the existed, existing value of uh, i variables from the memory. This is the first step. The second is um, adding five to the existing uh, value of i. And the third step is uh, write back these results into memory. Mm. In modern CPU, um, there is uh, the mechanism that, that allows uh, to execute this operation as a single instruction. So Java Atomics use this feature and uh, allows us to uh, have more faster mechanism than, uh, than using just blocks or conditions. <clears throat> Okay, let's get back to the presentation. So this is the uh, last slide uh, for today. Uh, and um, let's talk uh, about tasks and thread pools. So as I told, uh, constructing a new thread is um, somewhat expensive uh, because it involves interaction with the operating system. Uh, if our program uh, creates a large number of short-lived threads, uh, we don't have uh, to, to map each task to a separate thread. But uh, instead, we can just use a thread pool and uh, this pool contains a number of threads that are ready to run and it can execute the code we provide for the execution. It, it doesn't need to uh, create each time, thread each time when we need to execute some small piece of code. Uh, there, there are a lot of different uh, kind of pools in Java, uh, but I took um, basic uh, mechanism that allows us to create the pools. So in Java, uh, the executor service, it's a basic um, interface that um, we can use to uh, create thread pool or schedule a thread pool. So, uh, with thread pool, we, we can create a simple number of threads. Uh, we schedule it, we, we may uh, also create a, a thread pool, but we, we can assign some specific uh, delay uh, or time uh, when this thread can be executed. And here you can see the list of static uh, methods of uh, executor service that allows us to create thread pool. 
uh, I thought that uh, we will have live coding session, but uh, just to save uh, your time uh, and and my, I decided to create uh, some some code examples beforehand. Uh, so, do do you see uh, the code right now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yep. So the basic and the most, I would say, iconic example of uh, of uh, practicing multi-threading is uh, banking. Like, uh, because um, if you have uh, some accounts, uh, we may uh, do a lot of different operations with this account by transferring the money, by withdrawing uh, the money. So I choose uh, this example. And here I coded very, very simple application that allows us to uh, to put money uh, into account and to withdraw uh, money uh, from account. So here we can see a met method transfer that do this. And uh, here is the real application that creates online banking and do uh, two transactions. So the first transaction put 10, points of money into account and uh, the second uh, do uh, like the second does uh, the withdraw uh, operation and uh, takes 15 points of money from the account. Um, so if you live in a single uh, threaded world, so it, it is good to have this program and uh, we don't need any multi-threading or concurrency, but uh, in real life, uh, this this program will be uh, useless. So I decided to create a version two of this program, and let's review uh, what changes I did to uh, make it more concurrent. Uh, the first item uh, I did I created the thread. So our our thread takes uh, our banking. Uh, application uh, takes transfer amount we are going to uh, process and it also generate a random transaction UID just to track our transaction. And uh, here we have simple run method uh, that takes our banking application and does transfer operation. Also, I extended a bit uh, actual uh, main method of this application. I added a, a bunch of transactions uh, to this application and also start, uh, started each of these transaction in parallel. And the, the main changes was done in uh, transfer method, so I did synchroniz synchronization of this operation just to get the correct result of the execution. Well, like this is uh, our critical section and without this synchronized uh, keyword, uh, there will be a race condition when multiple threads will race for this, uh, for this operation. So when we uh, try to execute this program without the synchronization, we will get uh, different results each time. So this uh, transaction were organized in a way that as a result of execution, we, uh, we won't have any money on our account. So as a result of execution, the balance should be zero, but we have minus seven. Let's execute it again. And we have different different result, so that that is because uh, the race condition happen here. Let's put synchronize and execute this program again. So we have zero balance. Let's execute it again. We also have zero balance. Uh, so we can use synchronized uh, on a method level, but, but we can also use it 
uh, on the code level and synchronize the specific uh, block of code. So we may use uh, this as a object of the synchronization. Uh, as I told, each Java object has uh, built in intrinsic log, so we can use this uh, or we can use separate uh, log, separate object to uh, for locking uh, this, this operation. So let's try to execute it again. We also will have the same result. So the, the result will be uh, zero balance on our account. Then I decided to add few more requirements to the application. So I, I wanted to restrict uh, taking a loan from this account. So if, if I don't have enough money uh, in, on this account, the transaction that uh, tries to withdraw some amount of money will wait until some other transaction put additional amount of money and they will be enough to uh, execute the, the transaction. So to implement this, I used the intrinsic locking mechanism and the uh, associated, associated condition to this lock. Uh, so I added additional uh, condition to check if the amount of uh, money is enough to do a transaction. And if it is not, I, I'm waiting for three, three seconds and uh, try to check this condition again. If uh, the amount of money is enough, this will be executed and the transaction will be completed. Uh, before it completes, I uh, call notify all in order to tell uh, to all waiting thread that this critical section is free and it, some other thread can enter to this uh, block of code and do uh, execute the transaction. Okay, this is not needed here. So uh, does anybody know why uh, did I put while here? Why didn't I just put if here? Because we may have race condition. In a week. No. Because we need to repeat this. Why do we need to repeat this? Because data can be updated in another thread and we need to repeat with this operation. Uh, and uh, yeah. actually, we, we, we like uh, that, that's, that's true, but uh, one more important item why do I put while here is because um, Java documentation uh, tells that thread can walk up. Uh, in a random way. So even if we call uh, wait and don't call uh, notify all, uh, it, Java, I don't know the, the re actual reason, but uh, they uh, tell that waiting thread can be woke up uh, in a random manner. So if it uh, woke up, uh, the loop will be started again and uh, we will, all, we, if, this condition is not met, we will uh, wait again. That's why here uh, while uh, is put. One more requirement to use wait and notify all. This method should be um, called in a synchronized block of code. So uh, just because our method is synchronized, we are safe to call wait and notify all. Mm. I believe yeah. that will even throw an exception if we don't have synchronized in the method and we call wait notify. Exactly, yeah. Let's try to execute it. 
it's a legal monitor state except exception. So we are required to do this in, in a way. Um, that, that's all changes I did into version three of the application and let's execute it. By, so based on log, uh, logs, uh, our program uh, tried to withdraw some amount of money, but initial amount was 10. So uh, it, 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 uh, it, it waited a bit until some other transaction um, put additional amount of money to the account. Uh, and uh, these transactions were designed in the same way. So as a result, we uh, have to have zero balance on our account. Let's move to the late, uh, last version of the application. So here I did a few more changes to the banking and um, the first change I did, I uh, finally implemented Runnable. No difference here in the code, but just change uh, thread, extend thread to implement Runnable. Also, I used uh, thread pool. Uh, I used fixed thread pool uh, for 10 threads. Uh, I did changes to the uh, actual starting of the thread. So right now I'm not starting starting a thread. I just submit uh, my, my transaction to the thread pool and it will be executed in case some uh, idle thread is present and uh, it will take our transaction and execute it. I also added the mechanism of uh, shutting down the thread pool when our application is done. So one important item to mention here is uh, when we call a shutdown, it doesn't mean that uh, our um, thread pool will be closed and uh, all the pending transactions uh, won't be executed. Uh, this means that no, uh, it tells to the pool that no any other uh, transaction can be accepted for the execution. And uh, after that, we wait a bit until some pending transactions are executed and uh, we can safely shut down this uh, pool. In case something happens, something unexpected happened, we just shut down it now, uh, just not to wait uh, for a long time and uh, that's it. Also, I added uh, additional requirement to the banking to calculate the total income and total expenses on our account. So for this, I used um, Atomix. And as you can see, uh, here is the method that calculates these uh, totals. And as you can see, it is called uh, from not syn synchronized block of code. So it is safe to do it uh, in a way like this. Mm, additional changes I did, I changed the uh, type of logs uh, I used. So I, de I decided to use um, not intrinsic log, but uh, Java, Java log and I used uh, re-entrant log. This means that uh, this, uh, we, can, we can lock it multiple times uh, and uh, in case you have some specific algorithm, we can do like this, lock and lock it again. And if we lock uh, twice, we also have to unlock uh, it twice. Also, I used associated uh, condition to this lock and um, I created it here. As I told uh, uh, earlier, log, uh, intrinsic log uh, has limited number of conditions. So it, it has only one condition, but I can 
uh, for this kind of lock, I can create multiple conditions uh, if I need them. And uh, using this kind of condition is quite similar to intrinsic one, but just uh, different met methods should be called instead of, uh, of uh, instead of calling wait, we call await, and instead of calling notify all, we call signal all. So this mechanism with, with such uh, locks and uh, associated conditions. Uh, it's much flexible uh, than intrinsic locks. So I decided to do such a refactoring. Let's try to execute this, this program. So we have uh, zero balance. Initial amount of money was 10. So we spent uh, 41 points of money and uh, income was 31. So the result is, is correct. That's it from me. Uh, if you have any questions, it, it's a good time to ask. <laughs>